You know, I've come to the conclusion that the book of Romans is hard. <laughs> it's just hard. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm about a chapter ahead of everyone in my translating and my study. And, and, but when you understand it, when we when I, when I hopefully when I present it to you and we understand what Paul's actually trying to say to us, it, it's pretty awesome. This morning we'll be looking in Romans the tenth chapter, verses one through ten. Now I'll tell you something. Last Sunday's message just it was it was pretty scary. We talked about God's wrath on the evil man, and boy. They deserve it, right? Just give it to them, God. Those evil people out there. Well, he's going to be talking to me this morning after I just did that. <laughs> this morning will be a little different. You might have went through last Sunday and said, you know, I don't really do all those bad things, so I'm in pretty good shape. You're going to have a very first shock this morning. There are some good people in this world who are not Christians. They do good things. We have Christians who do evil things. And sometimes we kind of get it mixed up and we think just because we do good things, God will be pleased with us. doesn't work quite like that. And if you think it does, you've probably got some issues that hopefully this morning, this passage will straighten up for you. So let's look. In Romans, the second chapter, we look at verses 1 through 3 to begin with. Therefore, remember the therefore? That was all last Sunday sermon. Therefore, because of you're facing people, these evil people who are facing God's wrath. Therefore, you are without excuse, O oh man, Everyone who is judging, for in which you are judging the other, you are condemning yourself. For the one who is judging, you are doing the same thing. But we know and continue to know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who are practicing such things. And this you are thinking, O oh man, he who is judging those who are practicing such things and while doing them, that you will escape the judgment of God. In Romans, the first chapter, Paul has pointed out the sin of the most notoriously guilty. He now speaks to those who are generally moral in their con and conduct. And Paul assumes that they're congratulating themselves that they're not like the people that, they, that <clears throat> Romans chapter 1 described. Whew. Escape this one. I'm not like those folks. I'll tell you a story. The Bible talks about a Pharisee and a publican. Now the Pharisee, he was all garbed in his his religious garb of the day, and he was he was at the street corner, and he was praying. And there, right next to him, was a publican. Now, publicans, okay, I'll tell you what, they're sinners. They just they're they're the scum of the earth back then. That's what a publican was. And so the publican was on his knees. And both of them were praying. Now the Pharisee, he was up, eyes uplifted and saying, Oh God, you know how good I am. And if you don't think I'm good, basically saying, look at this guy. <laughs> and, he, and he's going on and on with his fancy prayers. And then all of a sudden he says, Lord, I thank you. Or is it thee? I thank thee. That I'm not like this guy. And 
then the publican's down there and he had his head down and he beat his chest. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible tells us that the publican, the sinner, walked away justified. And you know what? You know what it says about the Pharisee? That he was talking to himself. <laughs> That's basically what it said. That's what we're talking about this morning. He says, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. <laughs> I know that as we go through this morning, you're going to try to insulate yourself from this message. I don't really do that. Yes, we do. Whether we speak the words that are in our heart, Sometimes we judge others about their actions, about their sins. Lord, I'm just glad I'm not like that, though. I'm just glad I'm not like that. But when we judge someone, he is telling us here that we condemn ourselves. After gaining the agreement of, with, of the moralist, now we all will agree on, on last week's message, right? We'll all agree that those are evil people. And they need the wrath of God. Now Paul turns the same argument upon the moralist. He says, you're no better. He says, you who judge another is condemning yourself because why? You practice the same thing. Now hold on a second. I don't do those sins. Really? Let's just take adultery. We'll get to this in a minute, but there's a certain standard that we have versus what God has, okay? Well, I've never committed the act of adultery, therefore I'm, yeah, I'm good. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about it? You know what the Bible, you know what God's standards is? If you have lust in your heart for another, you're committed to adultery. Now that's just one example. You see how the argument gets destroyed real quick by whose standards? Now you might say, why is it that what this man is doing is wrong. Now, so you, you, look at, you look at that man who is steeped in the sin, these evil sins we talked about last week. And you say, and you ask the question of that man who's judging, why is that, why is that man doing wrong? Why is it wrong to steal? Okay? Well, because I said so. No, no, no. That's not a good enough answer. Why is it wrong for you to steal? Okay, God says it is. So we're, we're going by God's standards now, right? Okay, we're going by God's standards. We never steal, do we? According to God's standards, you're robbing God when you're not giving your tithes and offerings. Oh, I say that. Yes, I did. It is not, is that what it says? The thing about this is, is that God says it's wrong, it's His standard, then we're going to be judged by God's standards, not by our standards. What, and the Pharisees had a great, great deal. What they would do is they would take God's law, and they knew God's law, they knew the law, and they would take it, and they would apply the strictest measures to, to people. But they would leave out the ones that they couldn't fulfill, you know, that they had problems with. And others had because they were using their standards and not God's. Notice he says something here. He said, practice the same. Those who practice the same things. Notice that the moralist is not condemned for judging others. I mean, too many times we just say, well, I'm going to condemn you for, you're being, you know, for judging other people. You shouldn't judge other people. Well, you probably shouldn't. You know why you shouldn't? Because he says you're doing the same things they are. You're sinning just like they are. Maybe in a different way. 
but you're sinning. This is something the moral man would object to. And I'll say, I'm not like them. You don't understand. I'm not like that person. Right? I mean, if we were to, there are some people in this world that if you stand me up and you say, who's the better person? I would, I would have to say it was me. Right? You know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about someone who's just truly evil. And I'm going, no, I, I'm the better person here. And you do the same things. But Paul will demonstrate that it is true that we are like those other people. And the point is clear. If the moralist is just as guilty as the obvious sinner, then how to will you or I escape the judgment or the wrath of God? It is not the severity of your sin that, that you face God's wrath for. It is the fact that you do sin that you face God's wrath. But too often we have gotten to a point where we think that we live good lives. We don't do anything majorly wrong. We're good people. And therefore God is not going to face the glory of wrath upon us. It's just simply a lie. It's made believe. And there are too many people out there, good people, who believe that God will never pour their wrath, His wrath upon them simply because they're better than some. Better or better than most. You is in fact emphatic in this question. Do you think that you will escape the judgment of God? And this you're thinking. That you're going to escape the judgment of God? Paul bears down here. He's letting them know that there is no exception to this principle. Paul's object is far greater than merely to convict also them of unrighteousness. Uh, so he, he, he robs them, absolutely must rob them of their moralism and their moralizing. Because they regard this as a way to escape God's wrath. Yeah. There's too much of that today. Too much of that today in our society where they just think, I'm a good enough person. You know, my sins, my sins don't, you know, or my good works are greater than my sins. And so I think God's going to be all, he'll be fine with me. Especially compared to all those evil people out there. Be careful. When we begin to moralize and pass judgment on people simply because of the sin type of sins they commit, then he passes judgment. Verses 4 and 5. Or of the wealth of his goodness, kindness, and long suffering, you are despising. While being unaware that the kindness of God is leading you into repentance. But according to your stubborn and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in a day of wrath and the revealing of, a, of righteous judgment of God. Do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Paul points out here that the moralist presumes upon the goodness, the forbearance, and the long-suffering of God. God's been good to me. I, I live a good life. I do good things. I'm not evil like these people. But, He's given me these things, so I must be good with God. He's going to introduce a principle that's not, that's not talked about much. We all, in, in, even in our churches today, we consider the fact that if God's blessing you, then He's, you know, God, if good things are happening to you, you're being blessed. If bad things are happening to you, guess what? Probably you're doing something wrong. It is totally far from the, the point. When God gives us good things, 
in our life or things are going well, it may be to bring us to repentance. Okay? I want you to look at the man in the gutter. He's disgusting. There's no value or point to his life. And we can say we are so glad that God has blessed us and that say that we are the reason that the reason that the man is there is because he's a sinner. How many times he said, well, he made his bed, he'll lie in it. How many times have we said that? Isn't that not the most ultimate of judgment on our part? Saying, yeah, bad things happen, so he must be an evil, wicked sinner. Good things are happening to me, so God has been kind, he's been gracious, he's been good to me, so God's pleased with where I'm at. He's given what he deserves. And I'm glad I'm not under that judgment. Paul says you are under the judgment of God. His goodness may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to our past sins. He's been good to us because he's not judged us yet, though we deserve to be judged. His forbearance may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to regardless, uh, in regard to our present sin, the very day, indeed this very hour, we have fallen short of His glory, and yet He holds back His judgment against us. And His long suffering may be considered God's kindness to us for our future sin. He knows that we're going to sin tomorrow, and the next day, and the next, and yet He holds back His judgment against us. It. He just holds it back. So considering all this, it's no surprise that Paul describes these three aspects of God's kindness to us as riches, blessings. The riches of God's mercy may be measured by four things. His, his greatness. To wrong a great man is, to wrong, is a great wrong and is God's greatest of all. And God is greatest of all and we wronged him many times, and yet he shows mercy. And his omnipotence. If someone knew all of our sin, would they show mercy? God does. His power. Sometimes wrongs are not settled because they are out of, out of our power. We can't settle them. Yet God is able to settle every wrong against him, against him and Yet he is rich in mercy. Yeah. That's how loving and kind our God is. When we deserve wrath, he holds it back. <laughs> the object of his mercy is mere man. Why would we show mercy to an ant? I killed a bunch of them last night. There's some food on the, on the counter and they were all over the place and I'll just kill them. Why should I show mercy on an ant? Why should God show mercy on us? Yet God is rich in mercy towards us. So knowing how great God's kindness is, it is a great sin to presume upon the graciousness of God. And we can easily come to believe that we deserve it. Yeah, we do, don't we? I've been good, so God's going to... all don't take away all these bad things. Forbearance and suffering. Men often think of this as weakness in God. They'll say things like, if there's a God in heaven, let him strike me dead. And when he doesn't strike them dead, they'll say, see, I told you there was no God. Miss, men misinterpret God's forbearance and long suffering as his approval. And they refuse to repent. Look, God knows when you need to repent. You know when you need to repent. And the fact that He hasn't blasted you yet, you should be thanking God that He hasn't blasted you yet. <laughs> Instead of saying, He hasn't blasted me, so he, mu we, he must be okay with these things that I'm doing. I want to read you something from Charles Spurgeon. It's a little, it's a little tough to hear, but it, it seems to me 
that every morning when a man wakes up still impotent, uh, impenitent and finds himself out of hell, the sunlight seems to say, I shine on thee yet another day, as that in this day thou mayest repent. When your bed receives you at night, I think it seems to say, I will give you another night's rest that you may live to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. Every mouthful of bread that comes to your table says, I have to support your body that, you, that still you may have space for repentance. And every time you open the Bible, the pages say, we speak with you that you may repent. And every time you hear a sermon, it's... It, if it be such a sermon as God would have us preach, it pleads with you to turn unto the Lord and live. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray anyone out there, and you're saying, I'm a good person, I don't do these bad things, therefore and nothing bad has happened in my life, so God must be approving of the way that I live and the lifestyle that I live. He must be approving of it. That is just false and is a lie from Satan. You haven't seen the wrath yet because God is loving you enough to withhold it from you, giving you another opportunity each and every day that you wake up, another opportunity to come to Him and know Him as Savior, to repent. It has nothing to do with your good works. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with repenting before Jesus Christ and asking forgiveness for your sins and allowing Him to come into your heart and live and change you from the inside. That's it. There's so many people out there that are thinking that God's okay with them. And the only time they ever think really about God and their need for him is when bad things start happening. Will God really get me now? No, not necessarily. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Many people misunderstand the goodness of God towards the wicked. They don't understand that the entire reason for it is to lead them to repentance. God's giving you an opportunity to repent. Men should see the goodness of God and understand that God has been better to them than they deserve. God has shown them kindness when they should have ignored Him. God has shown them kindness when they have mocked Him. God is not a cruel master and they may safely surrender to Him. And God is perfectly willing to forgive them. And God should be served out of simple gratitude. There are many, and this, this goes to Christians too, many people who think that God will only drive them to repentance. Only till they get, God he puts them in their last, you know, that last bottom of that hole and they can't see any light at all and that's when God, that's when they'll repent. That's when God is driving them. No! God is wanting you to repent in the good times. He's wanting you to repent now. He's wanting you to repent. And His kindness is giving you the opportunity in this good season of life to give your heart and your life to Him. Now, you're going to flip out on this. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Because of this presumption of God's graciousness, Paul can rightly say that the moralist is treasuring up wrath in the day of judgment, in the day of wrath. Yeah, treasuring up. The moralist thinks that he is treasuring up merit with God. I've been good. God's given me brownie points for being good. So he's thinking he's, he's got all this stuff coming to him, good stuff coming to him. He's condemning the sinners around him. That's what God wants. He's condemned sins. And I'm living a good life. These people are. I am. God's pleased with me. Nothing bad has happened in my life. And all of a sudden, I believe that I am building up points with God. Actually, what he's saying here is that he is only treasuring up 
wrath with God. The way God looks at it is just another day, another opportunity I've given them to repent, and another day passed with it did. And another, and another, and another, and another. As men treasure up the wrath of God against them, what holds back the flood of the wrath of God? Who holds back that wrath that's building up and storing like a dam that, that's sticking to break because of the pressure that's on it? Who holds that back? God Himself. He holds it back out of His forbearance and His long suffering. In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in the, in the first coming of Jesus, the loving character of God was revealed with His greatest emphasis and in the second coming, the righteous judgment of God will be revealed most clearly. So yeah, there will be judgment. Be careful about thinking that you're a good person without knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. <coughs> Verses 6 through 10. Who will repay every man according to his works? There we go. Oh, that's a good thing. Indeed, to those asking, or to those seeking through perseverance of good works, glory, honor, and incorruptibility, eternal life, but to those out of self interest, while disobeying the truth and while being persuaded by unrighteousness, anger, and wrath, <coughs> tribulation and distress on every on every soul of man who is doing the evil, both of Jew first and of Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who is doing good work, both the Jew first and to the Greek. Let's start with the first part there. Who will render or repay every man according to his works? Sounds like a pretty good deal. That's an awesome thought. Isn't it? It's also a fearful thought. And it condemns the moralist as well as the obvious sinner. At first, the moralist will say, well, that's okay. I, I'm a good person. I can, make, I can be that judge. I, I can be judged that way, according to my works. I do good things. I give to charity. I, I do this and do that. Until he realizes the standard of God <laughs> is what they're going to be measured up against. It's not the standard that, well, Dan, here's my standard that everybody we're going to judge everybody upon. Sorry, that'll fall flat. I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm not your standard either. Because y'all get away with a lot of stuff if you use my standards. When they realize, a person realizes it's God's standards on its own without care about it, who else. You know, who else is sinning or who's worse than I am. But when we use God's standards and not man's to measure ourselves with, our deeds will be enough to condemn us. And it's not a good thing to be measured according to our deeds. Eternal life to those. Let me ask you this. Have you ever sinned against your conscience? When you knew that something wasn't right, but you did it anyway? Have you sinned against His Word in any way, shape, or form? Have you ever done something that you knew wasn't right? You're going to be judged by it. Yeah. You're going to be judged in the same way as that that person in the, the vile and wicked center in the street to go. You know, if someone, and this is the last part, verses 8, 9, and 10. It, where it says, but to those uh, out of self-interest, uh, go to verse 9 and 10, please, thanks. Tribulation is stress on, on every soul of man who is doing evil, both of the Jew and Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who is doing good. Um, <clears throat> eternal life. And you know what? If you lived a perfect life, 
you could earn eternal life. If you never sinned and never had sinned, you could actually earn eternal life. Right? I'm out. I'm out. And I'm going to be bold enough to say you are too. I'll just say it. Now, if I said that y'all, I was closer than y'all were, I'd be doing, I'd be doing like the moralists, right? Judging about who's better, who's about who's a, more of a sinner. But there is none, because all, in some way or another, are, have been, or will be, self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. These two last two verses. I want to make sure you understand what they're saying. Sometimes the written word is hard to is hard to get. It's kind of like on your it's kind of like on your phones when you're texting somebody and if you put the wrong emoji or don't put an emoji on it at all, you know you're you're sitting there typing and you can totally misunderstand what a person's saying. Sarcasm does not work well. Okay, and this is what he's doing here. Tribulation and distress on every soul who is doing the evil, both of Jew first and of Greek. He says, if you're doing evil, you got tribulation on you. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who is doing good, both to Jew first and to the Greek. Now it just sounds like, well, if you do good, you'll get glory, honor, and peace. Being a little sarcastic. You just keep doing what you keep doing good stuff, you might get some glory, you might get some honor, and you might get some peace, but you will not get eternal life. Doesn't say eternal life up there, does it? You, doing good is good, but you're still going to be judged according to His standards. We all fall short of this standard of God's constant goodness. God's wrath will come to all who do evil without respect to whether they're Jew or Gentile. Black or white. Jew, Arab. It doesn't matter. You name the class. God's going to judge you. That's pretty, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't even get on down or like this. If you'll give me a second. We're going to bring it back up. Because this is for the moral man. A man who does not know God but lives a good life. And I think most of y'all know the difference, don't you? You already know that it's not about your good works. You already know that you can't rely on that. Sometimes we don't hear God talk to us to repent because we think we're all right. And we'll talk more about that next week. Look what it says in John 3, 36. In John 3, 36 it says... He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. That's it. If you think that you can find any other way to be saved by your good works, by the believing in anything else, that's it. And so as we went through this this morning, you may be here and you may say, well, I'm a good person. I don't need to be saved because there's really nothing to be saved from. You're lying, being lied to. You're going to be judged just like the evil sinner. And there is a world full of moral people. You don't know. They think God's just going to He's been treating them good. He'll continue to treat them good. And they're all right. No, they're not. You're never all right with God until you come to Him and ask Him for His, uh, for his salvation in your heart and life. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can save us. <clears throat> Good news. Trusting and believing in Him. 
Not believing in ourselves, not believing in anything else in this life, but simply believing in Him. That is the only thing that will keep us away from God's wrath. It's it. Let's quit pretending it's anything else. So as we stand and we prepare for an invitation this morning, I don't know your heart. I don't know your life. I do not know how, what it is that you need to do with God with this morning. But I'll tell you this. If for any reason, shape, or form that you believe that uh, your good works are keeping you in good God's good stead, you are mistaken. And that when we judge others because of their actions, it should just point those fingers right back at us, all four of them and say, three of them and say, uh, man, i got issues too. Maybe I shouldn't be judging them so harshly. Because until I deal with my issues with God. But you got to realize you've got issues, don't you? you got to realize you gotta, you got a problem before you can fix it. And this morning, maybe, we come to that point with God this morning that we wrote. Number one, if you're, in, if you're here and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're facing that day of wrath. If not in this life, in the life to come, you will face that wrath of His and you won't like it. Maybe you're here today and you're a saved child of God, but you're living comfortably in your sin, thinking that you're good enough and never checking with God to see if it's where He wants you to be and just assuming because everything's going good that, you know, that He... No, that may not be the case. You, only you and God can get that one. Right. <clears throat> this morning, let's look to God for our answers. Let's look to God to see, uh, to see the answers to our problems. So as we sing this morning, if God's dealing with your heart, would you come forward and would you make it right with Him? What, do whatever it is that He's wanting you to do as we sing. Number 543. 543. Mm -hmm. 